about Jesus. We're singing his name over our lives, over our families. There is power when we lift his name high. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and in every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Come on, do you believe that this morning? I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Come on, let's sing it out together Your name is power Your name is healing Your name
name of Jesus brings healing and it brings, he brings life. Welcome to Keystone Church this morning. You can go ahead and find your seat. We want to welcome you, whether you're worshiping with us here in person or online. Thank you for being here. My name is Jody. I'm one of our pastors here. And uh, if it's your very first time with us here at Keystone Church, you are a VIP guest. We're so glad you're here. Keystone, can we welcome all of our VIP guests? Man, they got out of bed, got to church this morning for the very first time. And uh, if, it is, if it is your first time, we would love to meet you in our lobby, uh, in our great hall. We have a VIP area just for you. Great team there to meet you, uh, give you a gift for being our guest. Uh, if you're joining us online, hello online family, you can text hello to the number on the screen and we'll send you a gift as well. Well, it's a special day at Keystone Church because it's baby dedication Sunday. And so we have some families here this morning. Yeah, if we're gonna celebrate babies, let's celebrate baby dedication Sunday. So we have families that are coming this morning. I'm going to call out their name now. This is Keystone style baby dedication, okay? If you've never been a baby dedication here, we celebrate. So these families, they, they got their kids up. They got them ready. They look amazing today. They look amazing. So you know the stressors that come with that family. So we're going to celebrate, encourage them when they come out. And uh, it's going to be a special opportunity. First up, we have Austin and Daniela. And they're here this morning to dedicate Everett. There we go. Next up, Alexander and Malia are here to dedicate Theodore. Next, Colin and Laura are dedicating Wesley this morning. Gary and Candace are dedicating Walter this morning. Yeah. Next up, Donovan and Taylor are here to dedicate Blair. Kelby and Kaya are here to dedicate Jace and Porter this morning. David and Alexandra are here to dedicate Nicholas. There you go. Jacob and Jacqueline are here to dedicate Jameson this morning. Timothy and Virginia are here to dedicate Mackenzie. <laughs> Kumaran is here to dedicate Kai this morning. We have Preston and Shelby here to dedicate Miles. Clay and Natalie are here to dedicate Eastland. Kyle and Carissa are here to dedicate Selah this morning. Brandon and Ashley are dedicating Miley. No. Caleb and Olivia are dedicating Elijah. And Andy and Brittany are here to dedicate Holland this morning. Keystone Church, can we just celebrate all these awesome families to dedicate this morning? Celebrate that. Yeah, isn't that great? And you know, I love that we can't even fit them on our stage. And this is just the 11 o'clock. We did this at the nine o'clock as well. And as you see these little ones, let us remind ourselves that we love, right Keystone? We love, love, love the young generation. We are passionate about the young generation. This right here is how you change the world right here. So I want to read from scripture, a place that I believe is so powerful. And as I read this, this is not something we are spectating. We as a church are reading this together, committing ourselves together to dedicate ourselves as we dedicate these children. So if you love somebody up here, but even if you're just a part of the spiritual family here at Keystone, we are in this together. Let's read this. Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go to late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed 
is the man who fills his quiver with them. This is the word of the Lord, and we want to bless your children. We want to dedicate these children to the Lord. So church, could we just stretch our hands out like we are just agreement? We're agreeing. Father, I pray right now for these children. I pray that you bless them. Brother, God, I pray that you would put your hands upon them. God, I pray for your protection over them. And Father, I pray for these children to come to know you and to taste and see that you are good. Father, I pray that you'd fill these parents with your spirit, that they would be better than the generations that have come before them. God, that they would lean on you more, that they would trust you at a greater portion. And Father, that we would continue to build an inheritance, a legacy that exceeds what we had because we know God, you are so great that the options and the opportunities are limitless. So God, we don't shrink, we expand. And we believe big for this young generation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, let's celebrate. Come on, let's celebrate. We believe. We're gonna continue to worship this morning. We worship our great God. He's so good and he is worthy to be praised. I've lived stories that have proved your faithfulness. I've seen miracles my mind can comprehend. There is beauty. seen broken bodies healed don't you tell me he can't do it don't you tell me he can't do it 
I've seen real life resurrection. I've seen mental health restored. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen families reunited. I've seen prodigals return. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen troubled souls delivered.
singing, I really felt stirred in my spirit that there may be somebody here today that uh, as we were singing uh, about I've seen this happen, I've seen this miracle happen, I've seen that miracle happen, I've seen, and it's just too good to not believe. It's just too good to not believe. And I just wondered, 
I wonder if there's somebody here today, you brought a burden into this room. And right here, right now, we wanna do some business with God. This was a little unplanned, but I wonder if we could go back into that song. Now, this is hard, but go back into that song two songs ago and just give another thought to just a moment of ministry if you brought an addiction into this room and this past week you stumbled. This past week you stumbled and you feel the shame and you brought this in and you're wondering if you can make it and you feel the words of condemnation over you. I got a word for you. You're in the right house. You're in the house of grace and we want to minister to you right now. <clears throat> Maybe you came in and, and your marriage is in a tough place. Whatever it is, or you're just feel, dealing with some emotional stuff, whatever it is, I'm just convinced. I just really believe the Lord is so thick on my heart that I want to call it out and I want to have an opportunity for you to receive some ministry right now. And so here's the way we're going to do it. And I mean, I'm, this is just spiritual family. If you would like to receive prayer, we're going to sing. If you'd like to receive prayer, I just want you to raise your hand and the people around you will start praying for you. They may not know exactly what they're praying for, but the Holy Spirit does. And so if you would like to just receive prayer for anything at all, maybe it's something at work, a pressure, a financial pressure, or anything I've already mentioned, just go ahead and we'll start singing over you and the church will just start praying for you. I, I know we didn't plan on this, but let's just do it, right? So raise your hand high right now, right where you are, raise your hand. This is what we do. Wherever you are, church, as you see hands going up around you, would you start moving as we sing over you? Come on. Yeah. Yes. A wonder working God. All the miracles I've seen feel too good to not believe. Yes. The wonder working. Come on, move in faith. And you heal because you love. All the miracles I've seen. If this is just for one person, we do it. The wonder working God. Would you receive that encouragement? Maybe God is saying, trust him. Father, right now, I pray for what you're doing in this room, God. We pray that we lean into this moment. And God, I pray for the person who came in here and right that moment, right there, was breakthrough. And God, we pray that all of us will walk into our great God-given potential that you've laid out for us. I pray nothing would stand in the way as we worship you in spirit and truth today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's clap for a victory. Let's believe for a victory. Addiction's broken, lids lifted, marriages healed, people healed. Come on. We believe. And before you're seated, before you're seated, I wanna tell you, at the end of our service, we wanna do even more ministry as you are as you exit the room, we're gonna have prayer, prayer team and pastors up front who would love to pray over anything you have, especially if you'd like to come forward and just know what it means to follow Jesus. We'd love to lead you to Jesus today, but as, you, as others are walking out, you may walk forward and receive prayer for anything like that, all right? So why don't we do this? Find three people and just say, welcome to Keystone. Welcome to Keystone. As you're being seated, something so exciting is coming up for us. We love it, love it, love it. May the 5th, we're rallying as a church and we're having a special give day and that give day is for summer ministry. Now, in the summertime at Keystone, we do not slow down, we ramp up. 
And we've always said when ministry ramps up, giving is jet fuel for life change. And so we did this a year ago and we were shocked at the results and the stories of life change And we're convinced because the church prayed and said, God, what do you want me to do? And everybody did as God asked them to do. As we did that, we saw more life change than we'd ever seen in a summer at Keystone. And so as we give, we're given to summer ministry, which includes uh, scholarships for kids to go to camps, both both on campus and off campus, kids and students. It's, uh, It's helping Keystone Cares, which is our effort to really be the hands and feet of Christ in our communities. Things like uh, kids going back to school, at-risk kids or kids that are in need and us being able to step in and provide things that they need for school so they don't walk in embarrassed or or wanting anything. And we we wanna step into that gap. That's the heart of this church. And so on May 5th, we're doing an above our tithe giving moment where we rally, we come in and we'll just see what God does. It'll be amazing. So start praying now about what God would have you do. Susan and I were even talking this week about some exciting things that we're excited about giving on this too. As we said, hey, you know what? I'm thinking this and start to have those conversations and and just more importantly, a conversation with the Lord and he'll he'll tell you what to do. So we're gonna have a lot of fun. Some of you, it's your first giving moment at Keystone and you need to know when we give here, it's fun. Like this is not, okay, I'll do it. No, that's not the heart. Never, never, never twisted arms. Only giving willing hearts And uh, it's an inspiring day as you see people giving. Uh, Some tears will be shed for sure as we give from the heart. That's That's the miracle of this church. Everything you see, it's from us following Jesus, being moved by God, not looking to the person to our left or right, just following Jesus, all right? So I'm filled with excitement over what God's gonna do on May 5th. Could we just all celebrate what we believe God's gonna do this summer as we help others and as we reach the young generation. John chapter 14, verse one says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself and there, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. And Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. I love Thomas. Thomas is my homeboy. Um, he, he really did not understand what Jesus was saying. And it's kind of like one of those, yeah, I don't know what you mean. And Jesus answered him. Thomas said, how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As we launch our, our series, or we launched it last week, Barriers to Belief, in week two, we're gonna deal with some roadblocks that people really have about Jesus. And I pray those roadblocks fall away today and it's a building day for you. Let's pray together. Father, this is the reading of your word. We pray that your word would come with power. Holy Spirit, would you do a mighty work? Would you walk through this room with saving power? And would you draw people to yourself in a way that is unexplainable by our minds? Father, I pray that you would heal our bodies today, physically, that there would be a healing and we would say it happened in God's church as we prayed for healing. Father, we pray that there would be repentance in the room where we would turn from our sin and we would get better today closer to who we're supposed to be. And we know it's all only possible in you. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. I was talking to a couple in the uh, the foyer just after, in in one of the lobbies after the service, and it was their 30-something anniversary. I was like, whoa, that's amazing. I was like, what did y'all do for your, what, 36 anniversary, something like that? What did y'all do? They said, we went to Whataburger. Yeah. And I'm thinking, bro, you got no game. <laughs> uh, and I don't know the story behind the story, but they actually had reservations at Perry's, which is really great. And, but they ended up going to Whataburger. I think it's kind of a thing with them. But fast food, um, if you're, if you're going to go fast food, Whataburger's up there. <laughs> if you're, if you're going to go fast food, Burger King probably not up there. Um, Burger King... So they, they have a slogan they came out with recently, 
and it, and it was uh, it was a song, and it and it it really caught. You know, BK, have it your way, you rule. Yeah, see, y'all got it, y'all got it. What you didn't know was they didn't come out of that from nothing. They actually were just doing a new spin on an old song. So I want to show you Burger King when I was coming up. Here you go. Check this out. We didn't have high definition back then, by the way. Have it your way. Have it your way. Have it your way. Two Whoppers, two Whopper Juniors, and four Coca-Cola. That's rough stuff right there. Long if you made one Whopper uh-huh. with no pickle and no lettuce. No, sir. Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. Special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us serve it your way. Oh, well, in that case, could I have the other Whopper with extra ketchup? Sure. We can serve your broad beef Whopper fresh with everything on top of any way you think is proper. Have it your way. Now that's the way to do things. Our way. Have it your way. Have it your way. At Burger King. At Burger King. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the way we used to do it. <laughs> I, I, I like the new version. But uh, the hat, we ought to bring back the hats. What do you think? I think we need the hats back. But uh, that, that phrase actually was a big deal, and you don't get this unless you lived it, because I used to go on like, like a track meet, because I ran track when I was in uh, sixth through eighth grade. <laughs> and we would go on a little track meet, and it was always go to McDonald's. And we would go to McDonald's, and I hate, I hate mustard. I think it's the fruits of the devil, okay? <laughs> And uh, I, don't, I really hate mustard. I hate onions unless they're like really caramelized or fried. I mean, I don't like onions all chopped up on the sandwich. I'm not into that. And by the way, while I'm at the things that I hate, I hate beans. I hate them. I hate beans. I just, I just despise, despise beans. I don't know if you're clapping for or encouraging me. I don't know. But um, so we would go on these track meets and we would always go to McDonald's. And it would, uh, you couldn't have it your way. I mean, McDonald's is socialism, Burger King is <laughs> capitalism. You will have it your way! <laughs> McDonald's like, you just take your sandwich and go. That's the way it used to be. And then Burger King came out with, have it your way. Have it your way, and now you rule. And I believe we're in a culture that is a have it your way culture. Have it your way, faith. Have it your way, belief system. Demi Lovato, for example. I used to believe, she said, and I'm, so, I'm paraphrasing, Demi Lovato, she, she says, I used to believe in God the Father, as I learned in church, but now I believe in, she begins to detail some kind of version of deity that she's just basically, hey, I'm just gonna hold the lettuce and I'm gonna add some extra cheese. You know, all those inconvenient scriptures, let's do away with those. And let's add some, some things I don't see in the Bible that, that the culture believes today that we didn't believe back then. And, and I, I just want it my way. I want God my way. Now, I do want to say this. I didn't say this at the nine. But what we're really doing it when we say, I want it my way, is God is not your God. You're not looking for a God. You're looking for a genie in the bottle. You're looking for a powerful deity that will do what you want that deity to do. You are not in a position of humility under the authority of a divine authority over you. You are in authority over that divine uh, authority. You are the one who sets the rules. Have it your way. You rule. Today, we're gonna talk about the barrier to belief that is a barrier for many, many people. And it's the question, is Jesus the only way? How could that be right? How could it be that Jesus is the only way? I mean, we have all these world religions. We have all these paths to God. How could Jesus be the only way? Here's some of the things we say in the culture. All religions lead to God, don't they? We're all on a mountain 
and we're climbing that mountain, and I'm just high-fiving the other religions as we climb the big mountain of God. Or they're all true. They're all true. We're just choosing to worship God this way. They choose to worship God their way, but really, we're all true. Or, but they all teach the same thing. I mean, at the end of the day, I've heard this, at the end of the day, don't we all just teach the same thing? See, these are the things that you'll encounter in our culture, and we need to address some of this. So we're going to do that today. O.J. Simpson died this week, and uh, I'll never forget that whole thing. Man, that was crazy. But one of the phrases that, that was made popular through that trial, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. So what we're going to do is we're going to see if the gloves fit. We're going to try on some other world religions here real quick, and we're going to see if they, if they fit. So first of all, Hinduism. We're just going to do a few. Hinduism. How did Hinduism begin? When did it begin? I'll go through it and I'll tell you kind of the eras that they began in and some exclusive claims that they each make. Hinduism uh, began, we don't know. Historians have tried and tried and tried to figure out. Their di papers have been written. I, I was diving into papers. It was very, very difficult to nail it down because Hinduism didn't really have a founder. Hinduism is kind of a bubbling up of a lot of different tribal religions in that Pakistani area of, of the world, in that area, a lot of different tribes, a lot of different beliefs, and they just kind of all came together. The, the, the oldest, oldest estimate of how old Hinduism was is around 2000 BC, which, which also happens to coincide with about how old uh, people believe uh, the Old Testament story began about 2000, 1500 BC, something like that. So right around the same time, similar time frame, you have these tribal religions kind of merging together to form Hinduism. And many of us think that Hinduism doesn't teach any exclusive claims because there's all these different gods. I mean, countless gods, all these different gods, but actually you'd be wrong. There are some exclusive claims about Hinduism that if you're not buying into these things, you're probably not Hindu. You're probably not Hindu, okay? Uh, one of those things was, is, is karma. This deep belief that my life is determining my next life. The things I do will come back and boomerang upon me. What, and, and, and we even have biblical language for this. What I sow, it will then come back and reap in my life all the time. Karmic, karma is a law. It is something, and if you don't get karma in this life, you'll experience karma in the next life, which leads to the second exclusive claim in Hinduism, and that is reincarnation. Reincarnation. And karma drives reincarnation. So, you know, you say, man, when I come back, and we play around with this language, when I come back, when I come back, I'm going to come back, dot, dot, dot. Well, that's Hindu. That's Hindu teaching. And the thought is that basically you may be poor today, but if you're virtuous, you will be reborn into maybe a higher class, or if you're in a higher class, and you lacked virtue, you'll reincarnate into a lower class. And this is also why they have incredible, almost deify animals at times, um, often vegetarianism, because they're like, man, I don't, I don't want to eat this cow. That might have been my Uncle Louie. <laughs> and so that's, that's the exclusive claims of Hinduism. Buddhism. Oh, man, Buddhism, that's, that's the cool one. That's where, man, we're all chill and just live and let live and love everybody, high five, and we're, we're kind of calm and serene, and I'm striking a pose. Strike the pose. Buddhism. Do you want to know when Buddhism came around? Around the 400s, 400s B.C.? Uh, it, growing up in a Hindu village, son of a chieftain, Buddha, 
he left his village and was really just disgusted with karma, and he was disgusted with reincarnation, he was disgusted with the caste system, he saw it as a lack of justice, and it was a way to keep people low and keep people in poverty, they just, poverty was constantly perpetuated and people had no sense of drive to overcome it, because they're just like, well, I'll just come back different, but, so I'll just accept the life I have right now. And he was disgusted by that, so he sat under a tree and prayed and meditated until he struck nirvana. This is rough, but it's relatively accurate. You know I mean? I'm, look, I'm going real broad brushstrokes. But he struck nirvana and reached an enlightened state, which is the goal of a Buddhist. And from the 400s B.C., there we go. Now, understand from the 400s B.C., uh, the story of the Bible is up and running. And the story of the Bible is up and running. And in the 400s BC, that's relatively new um, in, in history. All right, uh, some of their exclusive claims, there's no personal God. There's no personal God. So it's almost like the first atheists were Buddha, were Buddhists. But there's no personal God. But the strange thing is, if you go into Buddhist countries as I have, they all worship gods. They have idols everywhere. But the teaching actually says there's no personal God. There's no such thing as sin. If you're not into all that stuff, you're not going to be a Buddhist. So they have their exclusive claims and a total rejection of Hinduism. So that's Buddhism. Islam. Islam is the young pup at 570 AD. Okay, Christianity was 570 years old when Islam popped on the scene. Uh, we have manuscripts of the New Testament that are older than Islam. Do you know that? We have manuscripts. We have uh, old, ancient, beautiful, preserved manuscripts of the New Testament that are preserved that are older than Islam. So in the 570s, a guy named Muhammad, he went into a cave. He had a vision. He believed the angel Gabriel Again, he had a framework for the angel Gabriel because Old Testament and the New Testament was thriving at that time, so he borrowed from the Bible, and he basically reinterpreted the Bible and said, Gabriel is basically giving me a new revelation called the, the Quran, the Quran. Their exclusive claims are if you follow our law, you get to heaven. If you do not follow our law, you need to submit to that. So they're very, very exclusive, okay, very, very exclusive. You say, man, you know, I just... I don't want all these exclusive claims. I don't want thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. Even Buddha, I didn't know that. Okay, thou shalt believe this. Well, I don't like that. Hinduism, thou shalt believe this. Well, I don't like that either, so I'm going to be an atheist. I don't want exclusive claims. I want us to just all get along and be cool. So I'm going to be an atheist and just believe there is no God. Down with all organized religion. The problem is your foundation of your belief system is an exclusive claim. To say there is no God sets the parameters for you to believe in your club that you are an atheist. So there really is no world system that can claim to have no exclusive claims. There's no world system that doesn't have certain guidelines or entrance or exits. There's nothing like that. And one of the things you need to know is they can't all be true. When one belief system is saying this, and another belief system is saying that, okay? Just think of it this way. If I had you stand up, and, and I had a person over here, and I had a person over there, and I said, what color is my jacket? What color is my blazer here? And this person said, it is blue. This person said, it is red. One of them is right, and one of them is wrong. They cannot both be right. Two contradictory claims cannot both be correct. They could both be false, but they cannot both be true. So we're left with the result of, I've got to figure out what I believe. Well, before we go there, let me just point out a couple more things about these world religions, and then we'll jump in. I want to talk about persecution. When I say persecution, that's where, in the name of the religion that you follow, you make it hard for people. You will um, kick people out of the market. You will kick people out of their jobs because they worship a certain way. You will uh, beat them. Um, you will imprison them. Or even at its greatest expression, you will kill them. 
That's persecution. So who persecutes the most? Okay? Because as I, growing up in Western culture, it seems like the talking point is that Christianity is the worst of them all. That's the talking point. That's the talking point. The talking point, crusades, but the crusades. Let's go to the crusades, man. In the name of God, look at what the church did. I can't believe in a church that in the name of God would do what they did. Well, let's talk about the crusades briefly. Maybe this will get you going and you'll start researching some stuff. But the crusades began as a just war. You know, there is a thing called just war. That's what we teach here. We do not teach pacifism here. We teach just war. In a broken world, war is a reality in a broken world because God is a God of law and order. God is a God who believes in justice, and sometimes there's a thing, unfortunately, in this broken world called just war. Um, for example, there were Muslims who were imprisoning, Muslims who were persecuting, Muslims who were killing Christians, taking their lands, and the oppression was so deep, so bloody, so horrific that Christian kings and princes and nobility, uh, nobility left the comfort of their castles and went on a pilgrimage to go rescue their brothers in Christ in the Middle East. That's what they were doing. It was a just war. They were doing something that got their heart racing. They were, they were correcting an injustice. Now, this, this just war began as a just war. It went on for 200 years. So in the course of 200 years, there's some chapters we'd love to do over. If we could go back and we could talk to the church at that time, we would instruct them. We'd say, no, 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 you're going the wrong way. This is not the right way. How many people died in the Crusades? That's hard. History, I dug and dug and dug. History is very, very difficult to give us, it's very, very uh, unable to give us a real specific number on how many people died in the Crusades. They estimate somewhere between one million people died total on both sides, one million and nine million. So that's for history of that time. So we're, we're willing to ditch the church for a history that we're not sure if it was a million people who died or nine million. But let's make it hard on ourselves. Let's say nine million people died. So if nine million people died, how many of those were Christians and how many of those were non-Christians? How many people did the church in their religious war? And by the way, church and state were together. So anytime there was a war, it was a church war. That's another thought that we don't get our heads around. We try to look at the world through the lens of today. It's just different. That being said, how many people died? There were three million non-Christians who died, six million Christians who died. Just some facts. And you say, okay, well, are you trying to argue for Christianity? Like, hey, the Crusades make me want to be a Christian? No. But they should also not make you want to not be a Christian. And let me explain why. You should never take the worst chapter of your story and lift it up as the ideal. I mean, like, you have friends that travel in from out of town and they're like, you talking to them, hey, we're, okay, decided to hang out. Now, where have you eaten? Anybody here, have you done that? Where have you eaten? I wanna take you someplace great. I wanna take you to a great Mexican food. And they say, well, we've already had Mexican food. And you're like, well, where did you go? And they tell you where and you're like, oh my goodness. You're here, and you went there. And it's just so sad because you wanted them to get the real deal, and they're not going to get it, or barbecue. Uh, I, 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 I've thought, like, even as we talk to the angels one day, you know, when God makes all things new, and we're, like, hanging with the angels, and we're talking to Gabriel about how he did not give Muhammad the Quran. And... <laughs> It wasn't, and Gabriel tells us that wasn't one on our side, it was one from the other side. But anyway, um, as we're hanging out with the angels, I, and they say, hey, help me understand the NFL thing, football. <laughs> I don't get it. They're like, I just don't get football. So when I go to explain football to the angels one day, a thousand years into my new life on this beautiful new earth with my beautiful six pack and awesome time in the hundred, when I go do that, I am not going to give them the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> Here's how you fall in love with football. Go watch this. You don't give them the worst. You give them the best. You can fill in the blank on that. I'm not going to. We want unity here at Keystone today. 
You know, I'm not going to give them early 90s Mavs. I'm going to give them Dirk. I'm going to give them Luka. I'm going to show high fly. I'm going to give them 2011. I'm going to give them the last few weeks of the Dallas Mavericks, right? Yeah. yeah. And let me tell you something. Christianity is not defined by the lowest point of the followers of Christianity. Christianity is defined by the lowest point in human history where the Son of God died on the cross for our sins. It is defined by the lowest point by our Savior, which was the highest point for sinners like me. And so we don't define our faith by our worst moments. We define our faith by the best moment that intersected with human history, and that's where God came for us all. So don't get punked by that. Don't let that, that mess with you. Don't let that mess with you. And by the way, the Crusades were a 1,000 years after the resurrection, just to give you an idea of all that. How about some other persecution stories? Hinduism, persecution. There were, uh, even today, the Hindus are persecuting Christians big time right now. There are anti-Christian laws being passed. There are informants in villages that are pointing out the Christians. Uh, there are crosses and cemeteries being vandalized. Pastors are being beaten and jailed up to three weeks, falsely accused of forcing Hindus to convert because there are laws on the books in some Hindu provinces that you cannot share your faith. So when you think of Hindu and you think of Gandhi and you think everybody's cool and all that, that's just not the way it is. Secondly, Buddhism. Buddhism, believe it or not, there's a lot of persecution even among Buddhist countries uh, against the church. Uh, there's a story from Kin Maung in Myanmar. Myanmar is a hotbed of anti-Christian persecution. And again, persecution is to be beaten for your faith, to be imprisoned for your faith, to be killed for your faith, to be kicked out of your job for your faith. That's persecution for your faith. And this guy, he basically was a soldier and he had authority and anybody that was in his authority that was a Christian, he would make their life miserable. And then he would go into the towns and he would set up Christians and falsely accuse them and have them imprisoned and he would beat them and he would make life just miserable. And then one day, this guy got falsely accused. He went to prison. He was beaten, not for Christianity, but for this thing that he was falsely accused about. And while he was being beaten, he called out to Jesus and he had a vision of God and he became a Christian. That's kind of a cool story. I think that's awesome. But the truth is there's persecution even in Buddhist uh, corners of the world. And then the persecution of Islam is legendary today. It's happening all over the place. Go to the Middle East, and they're trying to snuff out the church everywhere you turn. And uh, in the 1300s, there was a, a man by the name of Tamerlane, and he was called the Sword of Islam. Killed 17 million people in the name of Allah. 17 million people. Okay? So Crusades versus just Tamerlane, we're talking 3 million at the very, 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 very most versus 17 million. Atheism. You say, well, what about atheism? I mean, that's just a philosophy, right? That doesn't kill anybody. It doesn't hurt anybody. I just believe there's no God. Actually, atheism is the worst. Mao Zedong, fueled by his atheism, fueled by his secularism, fueled by his communism, killed 80 million people. Stalin, fueled by his atheism, fueled by his secularism, fueled by his communism, killed 20 million people. There's 100 million people right there. And some estimates say that atheism has killed about 275 million people just in the last 200 years. So your godless religion may not be as virtuous as you think. So you say all that, and that's an interesting Look at the different world religions, but what about us? How can I believe that Jesus is my way? Well, first of all, Jesus wins my mind. I've had seasons in my life where I've had doubts, even as a young man. I remember being in college, and I was there to study the word of God, and I was there to train and get equipped in some way to begin to do what we're doing right now. And I was even there as a, as a Bible student, and I had some doubts, and God began to win my mind over those doubts. William Lane Craig has five facts that everybody agrees with that will help build your faith. Number one, Jesus was crucified by the Romans. Whether you believe in Jesus as your savior or not, historians agree Jesus was a real person and he was crucified by the Romans. Number two, Joseph of Arimathea, who was on the Sanhedrin, 
gave Jesus his tomb. That means we know where the, that at the time they knew where the tomb was. They could locate that tomb. In other words, they didn't lose Jesus' body. They knew exactly where it was. Number three, there was an empty tomb. So a tomb was given for this person who was crucified, and then it became empty, and women witnessed it. Women witnessed it. Number four, there are various hundreds of people who saw him risen. External sources weighing in, looking, Jewish historians saying, man, these Christians, they really believe they saw Jesus risen. They're willing to die saying they saw him risen. And then number five, the transformed disciples who, who had no presuppositional evidence to believe that Jesus would be crucified, die, and then come back to life again. That was a worldview they would never understand to make up. They would never have the complexity of thought to connect with the Old Testament. These are fishermen. These are tax collectors who had begun to follow Jesus. They really did see the risen Christ. And if that doesn't convince you, they didn't gain anything by following Jesus. They lost everything. And they were willing to die, as those hundreds were, saying, I have seen the risen Lord. Now that helps my mind. Jesus wins my mind, but he also wins my heart and soul. And honestly, I can't talk you into following Jesus. There needs to be a transfer from here to here. Something that begins to beat in your heart. And so I'm under no illusion that I'm going to convince you with facts to follow Jesus. But what I do believe is some of those facts that we've even covered right now may be removing some of the obstacles so that your heart is ready to receive Jesus. And if your heart starts beating as I talk, maybe that's God giving you the opportunity for saving faith. And at the end of our time together, when everybody else exits, maybe you'll come forward and say, I want to follow Jesus for the very first time. He wins my heart. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he is the way. That means he showed it. I am the way. The thing that strikes me about this, what does he say? Not my teaching is the way. I am the way. God is personal. Buddha's not personal. Muhammad's not personal. The dollar doesn't save your life. Though we count on the dollar for salvation, it does not answer your prayers. But the Bible talks about a man who pursues us. His name is Jesus. This is personal. God is a God who sees you. Every other world religion, we're trying to get God's attention. Can you see me? Can you see me? I'll follow Islam. I'll do these five things. And if I do them just right, did you see me? Did you see me? I am the way. Huh, I see you. I've seen you before the foundations of the earth. I am the way. He showed it. I am the truth. He lived it. That means he lived without error. Proving he was who he said he was. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You see, anybody you follow, me included, anybody, any human person, any politician, anybody you follow, they will fail. They will fail. And that's why, as the church, we need to lift ourselves to be citizens of the kingdom of God and understand we, anybody on this planet, they are fallible people and they're going to make mistakes. A politician you love, they're going to mess up. They're going to they're gonna blow it. They're going to say something wrong. Some of y'all think I was wrong for hating beans. You're like, I don't know that I can follow a pastor who doesn't eat beans. It just feels a little anti-manly. But the truth is that he is the truth. He lived without error. John 18, 37, Pilate said to him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, yes, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? And Jesus, the truth was standing in front of him. Everything you've ever wanted about God was embodied in Christ. He was true in a way we are not true. In a way we duck, he stood strong. In a way we cower, he was courageous. He is the truth. He is our standard. And we need that. We need that. And he is the life. That means he gives it. I am the way. I'm personal. I am the truth. I'm reliable. And I am 
the life. John 10:10. 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is eternal life, and this is abundant life. Yes, this is exclusive. There's only one way to God. It's through Jesus Christ. That's an exclusive claim. But among all of the exclusive religious worldviews that I've walked through, Christianity is the most inclusive of all the exclusive world religions. It's so inclusive because this is the God who chases after you. This is the God who left heaven, came down to earth, lived a life in the middle of a world that none of us would beg for. He died the death that none of us would be able to withstand. He took our sin in a way none of us are equipped to stand, and he conquered death, came back to life to give us life. That life is eternal life, but he doesn't stop there. Your life doesn't begin once you get to heaven. Your eternal life begins right now, my friend. Your eternal life begins right now. It's abundant life. It's abundant life. So be filled by the Holy Spirit of God and have joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And don't walk out of here saying, I, 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 the, well, my religion is tolerance. Tolerance. You know, whatever, Brandon, I'm just gonna have tolerance. I don't like tolerance, let me tell you why. I mean, I like it, but it's not enough. Tolerance is cheap. Tolerance is bubblicious. Oh, that's good. Not anymore. That's tolerance. Tolerance is bubblicious. Because tolerance says, I tolerate you, though I curl my nose at you. Let's just get along. I tolerate it. And that's better than outright war or whatever. But it's not enough because, see, the church doesn't stop at tolerance. God does not tolerate you. God loves you. We preach not tolerance. We don't stop at tolerance. Don't stop at tolerance. We go to grace where God says, I see your messy sin and, and it is offensive in my presence and it separates you and me and it is a lid on your life. Though I see it, I do not act like it's not there. I see it and I chase you and I run after you and I am winsome to you and I draw you to myself and I will heal your knees when they're scraped up and I will take you into my arms and I will fill you with a strength you don't have on your own and I'll redefine your family tree and it'll be better. No, no, not tolerance. That's weak, that's weak. Get that out of here, get that out of here. Grace, has he captured your heart? Let's pray together. Spirit of God, I pray for you to move in this room, in spirit and in truth. I pray some of the information we've covered would remove roadblocks, but ultimately, God, we ask for saving faith in this room, and we ask God right now for a Christ follower to be encouraged, because this, this was fueling some doubts. Maybe we helped. I pray for a Christ follower that wants to help others. Maybe something here has equipped them. But God, at the end of the day, I pray that we would experience you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we give God a hand for that great message? Barriers to Believe, week two. Wow. Great message. Like Pastor said, our team will be down front here in a moment, right after our service as we dismiss. We'll uh, give you some time to come up front. I want to go ahead and invite our prayer team to come forward. If you have questions about faith or need prayer over anything in your life, they're available right after our service. And uh, we want to make ourselves available to you. You know, God is doing some amazing things in life at Keystone Church. And we have so many opportunities for you and your family this summer at Keystone Church. Take a look. Summer is already just around the corner, and here at Keystone, that doesn't mean we slow down. We ramp up, especially for our kids and students. So, for the planners out there, here are some important dates to put on your calendars. Summer Jam is a can't-miss experience for all kids who will be entering first through fourth grade. It's an exciting three-day event hosted at Keystone Church June 10th through 12th. Each evening will include worship and storytelling, learning great truths from the Bible, fun games, crafts, outdoor rec, and more. We are serious about having fun, and we love creating opportunities for kids to make new friends and grow closer in their relationship with Jesus. Kids Camp is an incredible overnight experience for kids who will be entering grades third through six. We'll be going out to Lake Laval on June 25th through 28th. 
as a church, we invest in these getaway opportunities because we've seen how God speaks to our kids and changes their lives every single year at camp. God does this through powerful worship and biblical teaching, having dedicated small group leaders with your kids, and all of the fun, exciting activities, challenges, and competitions that they do. Plus, it's a great chance to build friendships and make those lifelong memories. Student camp is the most exciting and memorable week of the year for Keystone students entering seventh grade through graduates. We're going to Lakeview Camp near Palestine, Texas, July 8th through 12th for an adventure-packed spiritual journey, including special messages from Pastor Brandon and Susan Thomas, wisdom and guidance from our crew leaders, and awesome worship. Your day will be filled with competitions, team building challenges, and each night we throw a huge party this is a great opportunity to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ and discover God's design for your life. You can learn more and sign up for these special events right now at keystonechurch.com or in the Keystone app. Our church is designed with your family in mind and we're committed to life change and building the now generation's faith in Jesus in ways that meet them right where they are. That's what's coming for your family this summer. We'll see you there. That's right, we'll see you there. It's coming for your family this summer. You got the date, so if you're planning out your your summer getaways or vacations, hey, mark those dates down, plan around them, and we'd love, you can scan that QR code, we'd love for your family to join us, all these great experiences. Thanks for being here at Keystone Church today. Go ahead and stand up, you're dismissed, and we'll see you next Sunday.